Chapter 1 is an introduction to child development. Um, as we go through the chapters, one of the important things I'd like you to think about is the vocabulary. I know a lot of people like to do index cards, and that does get you part of the way there, where you have the word on one side and the definition on the other side. However, it is really important to be able to apply the concepts. So please also look in the book. You'll see wherever there's a vocabulary word, right after or right before the definition, there will also be a really good example of what that concept means. So please try to pay attention to that. Child development. That's what this course is called. Well, it's called child growth, but it's really it could be called child development. And it looks at how we view and study children in a variety of ways. The book definition, and please don't use the book definitions as your end-all, be-all. What I'd really like you to be able to do is articulate these concepts in your own words. Um, but it talks about how we grow, how we change, and how things stay the same. And when we talk about child development, we talk about the moment of conception, and that's when the sperm meets the egg, and we'll talk about that later on in Chapter 3, uh, all the way through adolescence, which is where most of you are right now. We will also be looking, when we talk about the field of child development, we break that down into three different domains of development. Those domains are physical development, cognitive development, and social and personality development. When we talk about physical development, we're talking about the physical makeup of the body. This can include everything from the brain, the nervous system, your muscles, your sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. Uh, it also includes things like your needs for food, for drink, and for sleep. It also determines whether you're a boy or a girl when you talk about physical development. I think a lot of people very quickly might think, oh, physical, it could be your size, how tall you are, how, how thin you are, how short, how fat. And that is a, a, definitely a part of physical development, but there's a lot more to it. Cognitive development takes a look at how we think. When you think about cognitive, think about thinking, think about problem solving, think about intelligence. All of those things would fall under cognitive. And when we talk about the brain, if we're talking about the physical structure of the brain, left brain, right brain, uh, growth in the brain, that's physical development. But when we talk about the thinking and the problem solving that goes on in the brain, that's cognitive development. Personality and social development takes a look at how we relate to different people and what makes us different from other people. When you think about social, social I always think uh, it's about relationships, relationships between yourself and other people. And with personality, in some ways I kind of think of that as almost the relationship you have with yourself, how you might respond differently to a situation than somebody else would be related to your personality over here, and I won't read these to you, but they give some great examples of physical, cognitive, and personality social development. Just to break down physical development, again, it's the brain, and again, that's the physical structure of the brain, not the thinking that goes on inside of it, your nervous system, your muscles, your developmental milestones, such as when you sit up, when you roll over, uh, the pincer grasp we'll talk about later on, uh, so it's your fine and gross motor development that we'll talk about. Cognitive development looks at your learning, your memory, problem solving, and your intelligence. And again, personality is looking at your individual characteristics, how you're different from somebody else. I like to give examples such as if there's trauma or if you're in crisis mode or if something seems funny. It could be funny or serious to one person and not to another. And how we respond to stress, things like that are often related to personality development. And social development, just think about the term relationships. I think if you can think about social and relationships, that can help uh, to remember. We will talk about the different stages of development, starting with prenatal. That goes from the moment of conception through birth. So it's the whole time that the woman's pregnant. And a lot of the times I think people think about the actual mom. When we think about the prenatal time, but we're actually talking about the development of the unborn child. Infancy would be from birth to about two or three. The preschool years, those go from two or three to about six years old. Middle childhood is about six years old to 12 years old. That's the elementary school range. And then adolescence, it says 12 to 20. But the truth of the matter is that until about 23, 24, most adolescents, most people's brains are not fully developed. So most of you are still in that stage of adolescence, whether you want to admit it or not. We will also talk about how culture plays a role in child development. Uh, I think it's interesting how different parts of the world look at each other and think the way they do parenting 
is the right way and maybe the way other people do parenting is the wrong way. There's a nice uh, passage on page seven in your textbook that just talks about some cultural differences in how much time you spend holding a child so, uh, versus how much time you spend putting a child down. So it's interesting uh, to see that difference. You might take the time to read that passage. When we talk about child development, there's many different kinds of things that can influence development. And one of those things is cohorts. And the book on page eight, and just to give you an example of when I was talking about examples, it says uh, each belongs to a particular cohort. A cohort is a group of people born at around the same time in the same place. And then they give some examples of events that they could be related to, wars, economic times, depressions, famine, epidemics. Uh, things like AIDS, and so different things that happen in life make us parts of different cohorts. Cohort effects can have impacts on a whole group of people, whether it be a bunch of girls that all get their period right around the same time, whether it be people who were uh, of a certain age when 9-11 happened, or whether it be uh, related to a disease or war, but all of those things can have a big impact on a person's individual development. In the book on page eight and nine, they talk about different types of cohorts, age graded, non-normative, history graded. So please take the time to read those. Race and ethnicity are two terms that people often get confused and that they use them interchangeably when they're really not interchangeable. Race is a biological concept and we think about skin color or physical structure or characteristics of an individual people uh, that would be in relationship to their race. Ethnicity looks at your cultural background. It's a cultural concept. We think about things like someone's nationality, their religion, or the language they speak. Then we're talking about their ethnicity. When we get to chapter two, we will talk about many different theories and theorists, but uh, for now, we will just talk about two. Uh, John Locke, he lived from 1632 to 1704, and he felt that children were tabula rasa, or blank slates, and uh, that's actually Latin for blank slates. And he felt that children come into the world, they don't have any specific characteristics or personalities, but they're entirely shaped by the experiences as they grow up. Jean-Jacques Rousseau lived right after he did, 1712 to 1778, and he said children are noble savages. He said they're born with the innate sense of knowing what's right and what's wrong as far as morality, and he said human beings are basically good. Baby biographies were about among the first instances where children were methodically studied. It's basically parents tracing the growth of their individual children, looking at their physical milestones, their language milestones, and any other important events. Charles Darwin, the theory of when you think of the theory of evolution, he uh, made it a little bit more systematic. He did a baby biography of his own son, and that became the beginning of a lot of more research when it came to child development. After that, others began to study things like conception and genetics and a lot of what we'll talk about all semester, which is the relationship and the influence of nature and nurture. Women entering the workforce and uh, getting into research made a lot of contributions to child development. Um, so there were a lot of shifts in development, in the research and development, when women began to be in, more involved. This chart is in your textbook if you have the most recent edition, sixth edition, this would be on page 11. All of this is uh, comprised of vocabulary that's really important uh, for the rest of the semester. Uh, the first thing we look at is continuous change versus discontinuous change. Continuous change would be gradual change when you think about something changing slowly over time, where discontinuous change looks at very distinct steps and stages. If you look at uh, this, looks is on a continuum when you look about a, a child and how they would develop versus discontinuous, which would be more steps and stage like. If you think about watching paint dry, that's more continuous. If you think about a maggot turning into a fly, that's more discontinuous. Or prettier to think about, I guess, a chrysalis and then a, cat a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Critical periods and sensitive periods. Critical periods are when we think about specific times during development where a particular event would have greatest consequences, often thinking about negative events, where if there's trauma, it would ha be more, much more likely to have an impact, where sensitive periods is saying 
says that people are more susceptible to different environmental stimuli, but it's not saying it's quite so critical. It's not saying the absence of it will guarantee one way or the other. The lifespan approach looks at different theorists who think about growth and change and everything that happens um, over the course of life and focusing on different periods looks at infancy, adolescence, and different developmental periods as more important in different ways. The nature versus nurture uh, continuum is something we'll talk about throughout the text, throughout the semester. Nature is when we think about biology. We think about things that are inherited from our parents. Um, it's also, we think about maturation, and that is the predetermined unfolding of genetic information. Nurture looks at the environmental influence, and one thing you need to think about is that at conception, all the DNA, which we'll talk about in chapter three, I think, uh, that is on the sperm and the egg at conception, that's what we're bringing with us for nature. But anything that happens, even in utero, before a child is born, for example, if a mother decides to smoke crack, uh, that is actually nurture, not nature, even though the child has not been born yet. So if a baby was addicted to crack when they were born, or if it affected their IQ or um, anything behavioral, that's still nurture if it happened after conception. When we talk about different parts of the world we, and um, how we look at society, there's a couple of different approaches. There is the collectivistic orientation, and this is about interdependence. It's a more Asian perspective, and if you think about the line, uh, the nail that stands out gets pounded, and that you don't want to be different, and that people work together as a society um, for interdependence. The Western society, more of American, uh, Western Europe, um, is the individualistic society, individualistic orientation, where it's more about the uniqueness of the individual. And you, you think about the squeaky wheel gets the grease, tends to be a more individual, individualistic orientation. Um, as we talked about, nature is genetic and biology, nurture is the environment and what happens in our surroundings, even things like parenting, critical periods we talked about sensitive periods we talked about. When it comes to violence, there's different explanations for the roots of violence, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, examples of this in later chapters, uh, but the question is, when you think about nature versus nurture, we think about, is a child violent because there's violence in their genes, maybe their parents had violent tendencies, but then we can think about, well, is exposure to video games and television one of the things that contributes to violent behavior in children. Some of the questions you can ask, how do we explain the violence with children? How do people learn to be violent? How come some people are violent and some people are not violent? Controlling and remedying aggression and discouraging violence from happening in the first place. At the end of each chapter, and these are, I think these are also in your book, these are looking back questions, just things to think about as you go through and do your reading. Views of childhood, how they've changed, um, how children are treated differently early on, which we did not talk about, um, but early on children were thought of as little miniature imperfect adults and they weren't looked at the way we look at them now where we realize they're still learning and developing and their brains are not as developed as ours. Um, cultural differences, societal differences, what's child development going to be like in the future, and then how do genetics and genetic behavior unfold. Please make sure you've read the chapter before you come to class. Thank you.